I need to have All right. Um, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, I would like to welcome you all to the official launch of TG124, Net Zero Carbon Building Design and Construction. This is a new task group started this year under CIB. And uh, I'm Niluka Domingo. I'm one of the coordinators in this task group. So uh, before I start, uh, let me first introduce myself and I will to introduce yourself. So, um, uh, and how and why we started this new task group. So uh, introducing myself, um, I'm from uh, Massey University School of Built Environment. And uh, uh, my background is in quantity surveying. Uh, I do research in construction cost estimation and construction industry capacity and capability, but my main research interest is always in sustainable construction especially on construction waste management. Um, I got the motivation to do construction waste management research after 2004 tsunami in Sri Lanka, because that's the first time in my life I saw that level of uh, destruction. And uh, I, I thought myself, would we ever be able to get rid of this damage? And not only construction, no, not only the destruction, but the reconstruction, the whole coastal area needed reconstruction around the country. So uh, that really motivates me to research more on what other countries do and um, uh, to learn more about waste management. And uh, I was doing my undergraduate then in Morator University. And because of my interest, I select uh, construction waste management as my final year research project. So. Um, at that time, my supervisor, Professor Ralph Dean Ramistein, he's with Moratua University, but now he's with the uh, University of South Australia. He's a task group member now as well. So um, he received funding from German government to establish the first CND waste management plant in Sri Lanka. And uh, our university did the research part of it. So. Uh, and because of my interest, I got selected to work as a research assistant in, in that project. And that was my first uh, start as a researcher. And um, because of the work I did in that project, I got a scholarship later on from Loughborough University to do my PhD in construction waste management. And when I was doing my PhD in construction waste management, there were a few researchers at that time in our research hub doing some work on embodied carbon reduction in buildings. This was 10 years ago. And at that time, embodied carbon reduction is a new hot topic. Um, so um, I always, with my construction waste management and quantity surveying background, I always wanted to do some work on embodied carbon reduction in buildings. And after completing my PhD, I moved to New Zealand. But in New Zealand at that time, uh, embodied carbon reduction, carbon emissions is not a big topic, interesting to industry. So I had to give up my idea for a couple of years. But then with new uh, New Zealand government's uh, uh, interest and commitment, especially with the new amendments, uh, they made in 2019 to a New Zealand Climate Response Act. There was huge boom in New Zealand to um, on uh, net zero emissions. The government's target is to achieve net zero emission by 2050. And so there was big boom in all industries, not only in construction in New Zealand at the moment to reduce emissions from um, from New Zealand. And this actually put construction uh, industry in a very tight position because in New Zealand, construction industry is very conventional and most of the businesses are small, small scale. About 90% of the construction businesses in New Zealand are uh, small businesses with less than five employees. So they are quite uh, reluctant to change. 
and also uh, they don't have capacity or capability or knowledge to go through this transition uh, on their own. So uh, as the only school of built environment in New Zealand, within our school, uh, myself and Suzanne, we started a research group with the support of from external funding from brands to um, help industry this transition through teaching and research program. And um, at one point we thought, if we can get more global uh, knowledge, what other countries are doing, because they are always um, one step ahead of New Zealand. So we thought if we can bring together the academics and researchers in this area, we would be able to help industry in a better way. So we thought CIB is the best platform to do this. And that's how we put the proposal to CIB to start this new task group. And um, we were welcomed very positively by CIB. And uh, my, Mike is not here, but I would like to thank Mike and Debbie for helping us in supporting this task group. So that's how we are here today with this new task group uh, with the aim of uh, bringing together leading construction industry and other experts internationally together to, to research, to share knowledge and to learn from each other on reducing carbon emissions in construction. And um, so that is about the history and the purpose of this task group. And in today's session, we have um, three parts. First, the task group launch. Of course, we started this task group uh, back in March this, this year. And we had one online information session in April, uh, but this is to uh, officially mark the milestone that we officially started uh, this task group. And the second is some information sharing from the task group coordinators, followed by uh, if there's anyone who is here um, either in person or online who wants to join the task group, we will share some information about how to join the task group towards end of the session and uh, followed with some question and answers. And firstly, to do the task group launch, uh, we are honored to have uh, Professor Mark Hustank, uh, who is head of um, construction engineering and management in Purdue University, and also uh, current vice president of CIB and elected president of CIB for the next term. So I would like to invite Mark to come and uh, do the official launch and uh, give the guest speech. Thank you. So I need to introduce herself first. So. Okay. All right, so I control from here. Oops, I'll, I'll do it. Well, we officially uh, inaugurate TV124. That was very nicely done. <laughs> All right. Okay, great. Well, hello, everybody, and thanks for uh, coming here officially to uh, for the inauguration, and to uh, and and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to share some of my thoughts on uh, this very important topic. And uh, so all those who are online, uh, thank you also for joining. Well, so let me let me start by going in the right direction. <laughs> so, you know, I thought in sharing my thoughts, um, I would start with the complexity of net zero. You know, of course, all of you, those who are here, know, but I wanted to structure my thoughts in, in what do we mean by net zero? So here are a couple of definitions that you see on your screen. Is um, you know one of them says achieving a balance between carbon emitted into the atmosphere and the carbon removed from it. And I'll get to the complexity part of that as I see it for the construction industry just in a few minutes. And the second definition, which is from uh, actually Australia, says net zero emissions refer to achieving an overall balance between greenhouse gas emissions produced and greenhouse gas emissions taken out of the atmosphere. 
So I think therein lies the complexity. And I'm very happy that uh, the organizers of this task group you know, have decided to uh, start this group and to take on the challenges and the complexities thereof in addressing uh, some of the net zero uh, carbon emission issues. So as perhaps most of you know that you know, it's all started with the Paris Agreement, where in 2015, COP21 uh, got together. There were about 196 different uh, countries that participated and agreed to the uh, Paris Agreement. And of course, the challenge was that, uh, you know, you might, you might know that in the past 5,000 years, the temperature of Earth has only gone up by four to seven Celsius. But since uh, pre-industrial era, so 1850s, 1900s, till now, it has gone up by 1.2 degrees Celsius. So this is drastic change in percentage increase in uh, global temperature. Now the question is, where did we go wrong? What can we do uh, collectively to address that and to make sure that that temperature does not exceed at that rate anymore? So clearly we need to make some changes that, that are going to lead towards that. So really that's really what came out of the Paris Agreement, as perhaps all of you know. And the challenge was that if we can keep that temperature rise to less than two degrees Celsius by, let's say, 2100, then that would be a good objective to go. Now, based on that, everybody took a challenge that, okay, two, two degrees Celsius is a good objective, but let's try to aim for 1.5 degrees Celsius and see if we can meet that. UK was the first country to take on that challenge, and they, they have. Uh, they have laid out an extensive plan that by 2100, they would reduce uh, uh, carbon emission to uh, the specified goal and make sure that they contribute towards the 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius uh, path forward. But of course, many other countries have joined in too. And as a result of it, You know, out, out of the Paris Agreement came out an understanding between these these countries that they would uh, they would establish a nationally determined contribution or NDCs as they call it. Every country that signed to the agreement agreed that they would submit their NDCs by uh, to 2020 and have certain other uh, elements built into that, such as the. Uh, long-term low green gas, low greenhouse gas emissions and development strategies. Uh, clearly that was not a requirement, but it was an optional uh, element that was uh, agreed upon by, by all the countries that are participating. And also they agreed that they would establish an enhanced transparency framework to share data, to share progress that they're making, and uh, so that everybody knows how much uh, efforts are going into uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction uh, by all the different countries that are involved. But that's till 2024. So we still have a few, a few years before we get to that point. But clearly one thing that uh, COP21 participants agreed was that developed countries should share the burden of making these changes. And so the finance part was that uh, developed countries would help developing uh, nations those are not financially stable uh, by uh, not only providing uh, funds uh, for infrastructure development, but also by providing technology, by providing all of the kinds of support and to help in building capacity that perhaps is needed uh, to be able to achieve the goal that was set. So clearly, you know, the entire world is, uh, is focused on this issue. So I really applaud the organizers of this task group to have started this. This is just the right time to do it. And I think if we can get the uh, construction industry organized and, and charged about what changes are necessary, then I think that's a good goal to achieve. So really, uh, great job in wanting to start the task group. And I'm sure many more uh, will, will follow in, in uh, being members uh, for this task group. So with that said, I thought I would share some of my thoughts about what are the challenges that I see 
for the construction industry in implementing uh, some of these challenges and, and addressing the net zero uh, challenge. I think first and foremost would be uh, for, for any given company to establish, you know, what is going to be the implication on their company portfolio? If they have to decide net zero, of course, the entire uh, means and methods will have to change. Uh, the, the equipment, the, the nature of how you approach a project will have to change perhaps. So what is going to be the implication on their portfolio? What type of projects would they have to choose or not to choose to go forward with? I think that is going to be a big challenge that, that companies will have to think about. And then of course, uh, you know, nowadays we, uh, uh, we talk about uh, corporate social responsibility, which also has now a new name where we refer to it as the environmental, social and governance goals or the ESG uh, goals. So how can they benchmark their ESG goals with uh, their competitors? And how is that going to provide them with that financial advantage that everybody in our industry wants to look for? So I think that would be another challenge that uh, we will have to address and research will have to be done to see how best uh, environmental, social, and governance goals could be established without losing profitability. Well, that clearly, they will have to think about decreasing reliance on fossil fuel in line with the Paris Agreement. And, and what type of changes will have to be made? What type of equipment will be required? Uh, is that equipment even available? So that really reaches out a challenge to the equipment manufacturers to see how best they can address the issue and be part of the construction industry in resolving some of the net zero challenges that we see. Okay. We'll need to identify a champion to draw a continuous improvement. If it is just going to be lip service, it's not going to go too far, right? We have to take on the challenge that in the next 10 years by 2030, 2040, 2050, whatever that challenge might be, that we will achieve the goals that we have agreed. That is 1.5 Celsius, not to increase 1.5 Celsius in, in the global temperature, right? Now, clearly, uh, we all know it's not going to happen from day one to day two. So structural changes will have to be made. That's where I think the CIB research group can play an extremely important role to identify how to address these challenges, collect global data to uh, figure out what is the best way, what type of uh, means and method changes will have to be made, what type of uh, equipment uh, changes are necessary, what type of process changes would be necessary so that uh, we are expending less carbon emission or greenhouse gases and that is going from our side and the process side that is going to implement and, and help uh, the goals of uh, net zero. So clearly, for any organization to do that, we need a champion. And that champion needs to make sure that the, the corporation stays on the goal, on the target in achieving uh, that objective. A few other challenges that I think uh, we should perhaps consider are that you know, whatever strategy we, we, we develop as a, as a corporation needs to be effectively communicated to our uh, stakeholders. Because in the end, if the owner is not convinced that the means and methods that we are trying to implement are really going to help them achieve their goal, and they may not be in sync with us in terms of uh, uh, net zero objectives. So that communication becomes extremely important that why there was a material choice that was made, why there was an equipment choice that was made, why is it going to take so, so much time and not more or less? I think those are issues that we will have to uh, communicate effectively uh, to all our stakeholders. And of course, in terms of uh, where do we start, it will have to be to identify potential for reduction of carbon emission or CO2 emissions primarily uh, through the life cycle assessment. Uh, life cycle assessment of material choices, life cycle assessment of the building itself, life cycle assessment of the infrastructure, that how much uh, carbon emission is likely to happen throughout the life cycle and where changes need to be made so that we are, as a construction industry, uh, contributing towards uh, carbon emission. As you all know, 
uh, out of all the greenhouse gases that we see, uh, carbon dioxide is the is the worst of it. So you know that's where primarily the focus will have to be. Uh, just to give you an idea, you know, I was looking at some data and I came across that five years ago, uh, heating and transportation were the two highest sources of carbon dioxide emission. You know, so heating and transportation. That relates pretty much to us, isn't it? In the built environment. So how do we how do we change our designing? How do we change our approach uh, to uh, designing new facilities such that we are able to cut the heating cost, we're able to change uh, the way transportation facilities get planned and executed, and thereby uh, do our bit in reducing the carbon emission. Well, determine changes in how we generate energy and how we use energy. So that these are two different elements that how do we generate energy? And the second part is how do we, uh, how do we use that energy? So from generation of energy, if we can go more to fossil fuel, uh, you know, is, is that a better option? And then the second, how do we use that energy in terms of what type of equipment gets used? How often does that equipment get used? Uh, what is the sizing of the equipment for the task at hand? Can that be changed? Can we change the process so that the type of equipment necessary changes and thereby we are reducing uh, the carbon implication. So, I mean, there are different ways of thinking through it. I'm sure as I'm putting these things in front of you, you are, your mind is churning as well, and you are coming up with 10 different ideas that, hey, how about this or how about that? So that's great. Um, finally, I think that we need to determine the cost and contractual implications. Our business in construction relies on contracts. The type of contract we sign is going to determine what is going to be the outcome of it. Right. So like in the US, for instance, uh, if it is a lump sum fixed price contract, you cannot expect much innovation out of that. Your profit is tied up. You don't have any scope within that contractual structure uh, to be innovative. But if it is uh, if it is uh, time and material, for instance, then yes, there's a lot of scope for innovation. So what I mean is that we will have to as as researchers try to determine that what type of cost and contractual changes might be needed so that we can facilitate construction industry to be innovative and to try out different uh, methods for carbon uh, reduction in carbon emission. Well, so continuing my thought uh, on how to move forward, let me share that a bit with you. I think, first of all, we need to understand what are the key variables in sustainability. We need to understand carbon emissions. Uh, what are the culprits in a, within our process for carbon emissions? What can be done to reduce that emission further? What are the financial implications on the company, on the industry? So in terms of financial performance, if we undertake carbon emission and if you undertake the strategy uh, to go towards net zero, what is the financial implication on the company and the industry as a whole? Uh, we need to be thinking about capital investment. That's more for the owners about uh, what type of ca uh, capital facilities they want to invest in and what type of design they can require from the construction industry. And, and by that, I mean the designers as well, that the ultimate uh, end result is something that is going to lead towards the environmental goals, sustainability goals. I say green the built environment. You know, it, it, is a, it is a paradigm shift. It's a thought process that needs to happen where everybody's thinking how to make the built environment green. And that's not going to happen just because one project you fancy should be, uh, you know, should be green. It needs to be a paradigm shift in the way we think. Well, so clearly, Identify man-made sources of GHG. Uh, that includes mostly, as I said, you know, carbon dioxide, but also your methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, and so on. But the culprit being mostly uh, carbon dioxide. Identify natural solutions such as uh, you know mangroves uh, to natural hazards. You might have uh, heard that you know during uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, 
the natural resources that we had for mangroves for protection were pretty much destroyed because of the salt water that was brought in through uh, artificially made uh, canals. And uh, that could have been something if, if people were actually thinking through that could have been prevented. But at that point, nobody was thinking that far out. So that uh, natural resource or natural barrier to flood waters had already eroded because of the uh, salt water. <laughs> so, you know, so we, we can think about what are some of these natural uh, resources that could be used for achieving that objective. Uh, use sustainable choice of materials. If in every decision we make in, in selecting material for our, uh, for our uh, facilities, if we already implement that, we need to check for sustainability. Perhaps that is a step forward as well. But again, it's a paradigm shift that we don't do right now. But if you implement that and research is done to show that that can also lead to profitable outcome, perhaps that is, that is something uh, that can be brought out by, by this group. Um, design for sustainability. You know, we can we can think about implementing intelligent planning units that are um, that are optimized for all the KPIs that are that are important. And once you have optimized one unit, then it's a matter of replicating that throughout the building to make sure that you know your goals or your KPIs are met or the key performance indicators as you build that facility. Few other thoughts. Uh, I think the important thing would be uh, to determine the meaning of net zero carbon to a company. And what do I mean by that? Is that how how engaged do they want to be? Uh, net zero carbon. Everybody needs to contribute that for the collective uh, effort to reflect in achieving the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. Just by one company. Uh, achieving these goals is not really going to help much, right? It's, it's a global problem. So first thing that I think a company needs to understand is what is their commitment? What is their understanding of net zero carbon? If it is an equipment company, for instance, are they going to be happy shifting to net zero? What changes would they have to be, um, would, would, need, would be needed on their equipment fleet that is going to help them achieve that goal, as opposed to a construction company that does not use major equipment. So the thought process will be different in what is net zero for me versus what is net zero for you as an equipment company. So I think that that would be an important issue. Align net zero and ESG or CSR strategies. You know what those strategies are uh, and how does the company need to proceed forward in trying to achieve these goals? Uh, consider and plan for offsite construction. Is it feasible that if we take construction offsite or we even design to take construction offsite, that it is, it is going to save uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Less people traveling to the site versus going to a factory and manufacturing there and just the modules getting transported? Now, let me put that in context. Uh, just last year, we finished a project for the Construction Industry Institute in the US. And what we were exploring was, what would be the nature of workforce in 2030? What would be the nature of the workforce in 2030? And the biggest result that came out was that most of the construction will be offsite. So if that is what is going to happen, then we need to think that in terms of sustainability as well, in terms of net zero goals also, that how is that going to help achieve the objectives of uh, net zero uh, carbon emissions, right? So consider and plan for offsite construction. If you if you are thinking in terms of the sustainable development goals, UN goals, you know you can reflect on 11, 12, and 13 where 11 is sustainable cities and communities, 12 is responsible consumption and production, and 13 is climate action. I think they all are geared towards uh, carbon emission and support the goal 
that COP21 had established uh, in, the, in, the Paris, uh, in the Paris Agreement. But ultimately, we need to follow the 1.5 degree pathway. And the goal is to maintain increase in global temperatures to perhaps less than 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100. So with that said, I will uh, thank you all for your patience and open up for questions if you have. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Niluka. Uh, so, uh, very happy to join this task group as a coordinator. Uh, it, uh, when Niluka invite, Nilu Kansasan invited me, uh, I was so happy because uh, it aligns with most of the research that we have been doing at Western Sydney University here in Australia, uh, attached to the Centre for Smart Modern Construction. Professor Srinath, the director, is also here in the audience uh, who, who has been a mentor for, uh, with the task group uh, activities. So, yeah, uh, uh, talking a little bit about myself to start with, the, I have been uh, involved in the sustainability re related research <clears throat> for quite some time. And uh, we have been working on uh, embodied carbon reductions and uh, looking into net zero, not just uh, reduction of operational carbon. And uh, with Srinath, we have putting together uh, some uh, ideas uh, to achieve net zero carbon in buildings uh, through uh, uh, design optimization, like Mark has been mentioning, uh, choice of materials and uh, design by sustainability, and then move to uh, 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 su supply chain, carbon reductions, and uh, even uh, choosing contractors based on that. And uh, yeah, we, we're working together and we have not noticed uh, over the years, like we uh, from the start, like three, four years ago, uh, the, there wasn't that much interest from the industry and the uh, people whom we were trying to talk and uh, request for funding. But now we've seen uh, uh, this has become a, really an interested topic for uh, many stakeholders and uh, uh, not like in New Zealand yet, uh, we don't have the regulations to start with, but we, we I think these initiatives uh, by the researchers and the task group will help to look it into different countries' uh, situation and the uh, status and uh, create a global uh, platform for uh, achieving net zero carbon in buildings and uh, infrastructure. So that's a little bit about me. And uh, I think uh, in the next slide, we have members, right? The first one to to join the task group. But before that, uh, So uh, apart from these members, we, we would be really happy to involve the new members, uh, anyone interested in uh, uh, working with us. And we'll be, uh, in, in the coming slides, we'll be explaining uh, our plans and the, the prioritized themes related to the task group. 
and uh, to the online group uh, also you all are very welcome and uh, i think we will start talk so, introducing uh, you an opportunity to talk about yourself and your interest and how you would if you would like to join uh, which areas and uh, themes you would like to help us with uh, yeah okay next <clears throat> Okay, so these are the uh, task groups themes that we tried to prioritize into four different areas. I think it nicely re uh, goes with uh, some of the challenges and pa path forward that Mark was discussing. Most of them were already captured here, and uh, we will go through your one as well and see whether there's any gaps. Uh, so to start with, uh, we are trying to create a global carbon taxonomy. Uh, so what it means, uh, what it means, uh, like uh, there's so many terms that we have, we come across zero carbon, net zero carbon, carbon uh, positive. So uh, we need to come up with uh, definitions and what it means in different countries. And then to create contextual factors, uh, like we know uh, different countries are different uh, uh, different states in terms of regulations, rules, and government support, and uh, also scoping. Uh, like in Aust Australia, we have scope one, two, three, and are there differences in other countries? So sector drivers uh, in different countries. So these are like uh, th things we want to uh, look in to create that global carbon taxonomy through this task group. And the next uh, area is on design and construction practices. So uh, what are the uh, current research and what, what do we know about uh, material selections in terms of uh, looking into net zero carbon, design and construction methods, uh, and also life cycle costing and life cycle uh, analysis considerations. So that uh, some of the things that Mark also mentioned, why companies should uh, look in, uh, consider sustainable aspects, uh, that there's a need for to show them there's a cost, uh, yeah, some initial uh, implications as well. So life cycle costing uh, would help in that respect. And uh, uh, on, on this side, uh, the third group is digital and innovation. Innovative technologies, we've seen the, this uh, technologies that help to achieve, uh, like for example, in calculating it, uh, embodied carbon, we've seen the many tools, but uh, I, I think uh, some of the research that we do in the center, uh, we, we've try, started looking into blockchain as a technology, how to accurately calculate uh, carbon emissions right from the source of uh, material extraction throughout the life cycle uh, uh, through supply chain to its uh, construction phases to the operational phases and then uh, looking into carbon trading platforms as a way to uh, like we cannot uh, we know we cannot make uh, uh, in principle uh, like, uh, go to zero carbon because we, when we do production there's always some carbon emissions so how do we offset carbon that uh, positive carbon so we're looking into carbon trading platforms and carbon estimating tools uh, and also uh, one of uh, my recent uh, interest is on circular economy so we try to be, 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 bring circular economic principles and uh, uh, business uh, uh, business uh, scenarios into build, built environment and see how we can close the loop and uh, go with more uh, reusing. And I think uh, one of uh, uh, Niluka's area is also on waste management. So yeah, so th that's one side. And then uh, finally, I think one of the, in the information sessions we had, one of the key things everyone was mentioning was the need to educate and make every, uh, the stakeholders aware about the z need for net going for net zero carbon. And we are looking into uh, create, uh, having some international seminars over the next three years, and also some student chapter activities and also publications, uh, uh, I think, yeah. Yeah, all right, uh, I think uh, next slide, uh, I think Niluka will be explaining the 
activities that we have scheduled so far? Um, okay, so uh, in next year, in in 2023, uh, Massey University is hosting OBIA conference. I don't know how many people here uh, know about the conference uh, next year. So uh, I ha I talked to Monty about the. <laughs> Can they hear now? Yeah. Um, about um, hosting a back-to-back -back, uh, conference after OBIA uh, in New Zealand on a CIB Incorporated Conference um, uh, on zero carbon theme. So um, we, we are, this is still in a very initial stage of planning. So please watch the space. We will inform about the uh, once we have once we finalize dates and everything, this will be towards end of next year, 2023, with OBIA conference. And also, um, uh, we are planning to do a global survey. So initial work will start uh, next year, early next year. So the purpose is to um, do uh, a survey on global uh, car carbon. Uh, in building design and construction. And Professor Srinath put his hand up to um, lead the survey. Uh, maybe uh, Srinath can explain it a little bit after I finish the slide. Um, and also, um, uh, we are planning to publish a special issue from the selected uh, papers from the conference uh, in uh, project asset management journal, BEPAM journal, which is a CIB recognized journal. And uh, finally, we are planning to do an edited book with a CIB recognized publisher on net zero carbon design and construction. Uh, so during the information session last time, we had very brief discussion, but we got lots of ideas starting from the definition to zero carbon, like Sepani mentioned, and also uh, Mark, uh, different people use these two words, zero carbon, to mean so many different things. Some people call net zero carbon, some people call near zero, some people call zero carbon, but nobody knows how much carbon is zero carbon. So, uh, so like Sepani said, uh, starting from the definition uh, till digital innovation to achieve this, we got so many ideas uh, in a wide spectrum, but, but we haven't decided on the uh, so scope of the book yet. It can be series of books with the ideas we got, but we are planning to have a couple of brainstorming sessions in the coming months to uh, plan this book. So if you are interested in just let us know so we can include you in the meetings. And also once we finalize the scope of the book and come up with the chapter uh, outline. We will invite people to write chapters. So again, um, 
watch the space. So those are the main activities we plan for the next three years as part of this uh, task group. On top of that, um, there was another idea for early career researchers because in this task group we have a few early career researchers, those who completed their PhDs and also doing their PhDs. So we are trying to organize something for early career researchers, maybe a couple of webinars per year. And another idea uh, that this came from Mike, Mike Bim from CIB. Uh, actually, the very first day when I emailed him that we have this idea of establishing a zero carbon task group, he's, uh, he told me, hey, look, uh, good timing. Uh, there are these uh, funding agencies um, in USA and Canada looking forward to um, invest on something to learn about zero carbon. I don't know uh, what, what is the scope of um, this thing, but uh, we will inform you once we get more ideas and once we do the um, background work on this thing. So uh, there, there, there are some um, parties, third parties that are interested in joining the task group. So, so those are the main things that we plan for as part of this task group. And um, Srina, do you want to talk a little bit about the survey? Thank you, Niluka. And uh, it's uh, really, uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, uh, carbon, uh, zero carbon activities. I've been involved in uh, uh, zero carbon research uh, since 2010 and a signif significant portfolio of work had been completed in that hence uh, a very important initiative for me personally as well. And in the uh, in Western Sydney in Center for Smart Water Construction, we do a lot of uh, research activities in uh, carbon emissions, which uh, uh, Sepani alluded to earlier on. Now, uh, on this particular global survey, the idea is basically we want to uh, uh, have an idea of what is happening in terms of carbon emissions management in different countries. So there is CIB is a global organization, so it pans across the entire world and different countries, different regions have different policies and procedures uh, to managing carbon emissions. Now we want to understand what are these, how different they are, how, what are the similarities, these things. So we thought it's a uh, survey would be a ideal instrument to capture this type of information uh, from different countries through that way. So then also we would like to understand what uh, units of measurement are there, what the, the definitions that the, the, there are different interpretations. There's scope one, two, three emissions. If I say in one way, then there is operational carbon and embodied carbon type of definitions. There is uh, zero carbon to net zero carbon, so to positive carbon positive uh, developments and so on. What do these mean? And do they have different meanings in different countries, different regions? Or there is a, a, a unified approach in that. This is what we want to capture in that. So the survey will also involve a kind of a literature review uh, as a, a precursor to the survey to understand what is happening and establishing what it is. And then subsequently, we will try to capture uh, what they are. So for the survey's implementation, points of action I mentioned there, we would like the coordinators, uh, the sorry, the members of the task group to say that uh, each one of you want to volunteer and represent your country or the region uh, in the, uh, whatever uh, situation, depending on uh, uh, the 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 place you are coming from and you want to represent. We would like to appoint those people so that we can take care of the survey locally in that way, and then we can collate all that information to the main survey. So we will be using. Uh, 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 professional um, survey platforms uh, in order to do that, uh, like Coltrix, for example, 
uh, and uh, the survey can be therefore carried out in different countries, in different regions, and different uh, and and the information collated subsequently. Uh, then we will sub uh, after that once the, the data is gathered, we will do some local analytics as well as. Uh, regional analytics to to the global set of analytics in, in there uh, in order to produce. At the end, the idea is to produce a report and report back to CIB. This is the status of uh, 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 carbon emissions, net zero, uh, and, and give a better understanding, produce a better understanding for all the researchers uh, working in the CIB and in the world in general. I think with that. I yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Srinath. And I think um, that explains what we are trying to achieve through this survey. And um, so the final final part, joining instructions, like I said, we are uh, looking forward to have more members. And that is one reason why we have this event during the CIB con Congress. Um, so if you are a CIB member, there are three very easy things that you could do. You can straight away contact Debbie Gray, who is the um, uh, membership manager in CIB and express your interest to join the task group. Or you can contact one of us, either Sepani, myself or Suzanne. And um, if not, you can do it now using the online form, using the QR code. If you have the phone, uh, I put it on big screen for those who want to join. Uh, even those who are online, you can join um, the task group by filling the online form. And if you log into online form, you can see the task group activities. So you can express your interest to join the task group activities as well. For example, uh, like Srinath mentioned, if you want to join, if you want to um, champion the survey in your country, you can express your interest by ticking the box that you want to be one of the coordinators and also mention the country you are from. And um, or if you want to, for example, for the conference we are going to organize next year, if you want to be a scientific member or, or part of the organizing committee, you can express your interest as well. Um, so until we take any questions, you can fill the form as well. Um, that is all for today from us. Any questions? <laughs> uh, hello everyone uh thank you the task group coordinator for all the efforts you um creating the task group and putting all the idea together thank you ma for the informative presentation and i just got the idea when i listening to your presentation about the challenge of the um uh, zero carbon net zero carbon so we mentioned about different challenges and um it seemed to me that um um like um you said that we should uh, educating the stakeholder about the needs of uh, zero carbon uh, including the client and all the designer professional and it seemed to me that my maybe we should put um the the uh, the behavior, one of the challenge to me is the behavior of the building user. So it might be a big challenge because uh, according to my observation, people in the building have different behavior in terms of using energy. So when we said that the way we use the energy might be a challenge for the uh, net zero carbon. So we might need to consider about the behavior of the a uh, user of the office or the home dwelling as well. So it's not a question, it's just the, the idea. <laughs> Thank you. I think. Oh, okay. So while that is being shared, I, I think that that's an excellent point that you raise. Uh, one of the research that we are doing is we are looking at New York City and, and how the uh, residents in New York City apartments are using energy. So very much in, in line with what, what you're saying. And I think the second point uh, that that I would like to make is, uh, you know, is 
what I mentioned earlier is, is how we produce energy and how we consume energy. So I think both of those elements are important, uh, particularly from a building uh, environment point of view uh, or the built environment point of view. The way that architects design facilities of how much energy would be required for the resident to use, the material choice of material use is, is going to make a whole lot of difference in what would be the net energy usage of that particular facility. And I think same can be said for uh, transportation facilities where uh, we could use solar energy for offsetting some of the energy requirements in the transportation. So very, yeah, I think very good point that you make. Thank you, everyone. Uh, everything was uh, very interesting, like to see how we can achieve net zero carbon. So one of the aspect which I'm researching and which I found very relevant in this area is how we can sequester carbon, how we can include that aspect in our building design, how we can use the building integrated vegetation to sequester the existing carbon which is there in the atmosphere, or how we can use some materials like timber to store carbon. So uh, use algae, mycelium, like those materials that can absorb carbon. So if we can have certain aspect included in achieving net zero carbon, I found that that was missing, I guess, or might be it will be added later on. But that was one of my observation. And uh, this is, uh, and I'm a PhD student, and I'm researching in this area that how we can use building integrated vegetation to sequester carbon and to provide habitat at the same time. So I'm looking for this relationship and I'm in the final year of my research and I'll be love to be part of this uh, early career researchers. And uh, uh, that's why I wanted to, I'll meet you later uh, for joining this. Uh, but then this could be one of the aspect that uh, how we can utilize the natural signs using the vegetation and even the soil. Uh, we can use green roofs, we can use green walls or uh, perhaps the green spaces on and around buildings to sequester the existing carbon. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for expressing your interest to join the task group. You are very welcome. And um, I think uh, your idea is really good. I think Sepani touched it a little bit under yeah. offsetting carbon. Yeah, uh, I think... Uh, you know, I said in one theme, design and construction practices, I think we can put it under that as another, uh, explicitly as another sub one, point. one way of designing the building. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, I think it's a, go a good point. Carbon sequestration is an important element and there are many ways to sequester carbon. Uh, and one of is it, is what you were talking about. There are other methods of uh, carbon se sequestration, including things like people are trying to embed it in concrete, embed it uh, in the earth, or even to use uh, seaweed and other things, carbon, uh, capturing carbon in different ways. There are many approaches, but sequestration as a title would be an important yeah. element to add in, I guess. Yeah. Uh, um, more. Importantly, what I wanted to mention was that uh, you mentioned about early career activities. Uh, so we have the early career CIB early career network. We sh could do that together uh, with the early career network, which is an important part. Uh, and and, and we, we, we can talk about how we can do that. It's a really good idea. Yes, uh, uh, because we are seriously thinking of uh, doing something with early career researchers because in our group we have a uh, few early career researchers who are interested in doing. So we'll talk to you, Srinath. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it would be a great topic for the next WBC also. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And if, if that happens to take place in at Purdue University, uh, Professor Zitor Bika uh, is here from Purdue University who's going to be one of the leading uh, proponents of the next WBC. Okay. <laughs> any any questions? Any other questions? Ideas? Yeah. Group.
uh, how about the online group? Yeah. Uh, can you get the online group? Just uh, as a point of sharing a uh, little bit ideas on, uh, we we are uh, very much interested in using uh, ICT technology in various aspects of construction. So part of it is how uh, we are proposing, or rather we have developed a methodology for estimating embodied carbon using blockchain. So that the system is basically uh, using blockchain uh, network implemented in the supply chain and capture carbon emissions uh, at each stage of the supply chain. So it's uh, using the value chain principles. So adding carbon uh, in parallel to addition of value in the value chain, we say that carbon can be captured in each of those points in the same way. Value addition, happens, then carbon addition happens as well. And that's the premise in doing that. And we have implemented that in a blockchain network, which uh, provides the algorithms to uh, estimate carbon emissions. And that would be accurate. Unlike current methods, they are not accurate. We have published actually comparing different methods of estimating uh, to show that how inaccurate current methods are. Uh, to to identify, there are many reasons for it, but that's something that would be very interested uh, to interesting to the uh, task group and just for uh, discussion. I mentioned this uh, for everyone. Yeah. Hello, Mohan. I can see you here. Uh, do you have anything to add? It's not unmuted. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> so if there are no other questions, we can stop the session for today. And thank you very much for attending and showing your interest to our task group and support. Thank you. Yeah, let's take a look. Red, red slide. Yeah, in the back.